Every profession, every hobby indeed, have tools of the trade. Some of those tools are very specific and others can be generic. Some of them only perform one function and others are really multifaceted. Those of you who enjoy cooking, you know if you go into that drawer, I'm talking about the little drawer that you can't ever open, and you pull out that little tool that that separates eggs, it separates the yolk from the white. That little tool is very good at doing that one thing, but it really doesn't do much else. Uh, On the other hand, if you have a very wide butcher knife, a wide blade knife, you can use it to do a number of things in the kitchen. Out in my shop, I have some tools that only do one thing. Over the weekend, I had to go buy a two-inch deep well impact socket. And that's the right tool to do one specific thing. I've got some other tools that are more like a 21-function Swiss Army knife. (laughs) And it can do a lot of different things. I share that just to say that in your scriptural toolbox as a Christian, you'd better put Ephesians 4.32 because you're going to need it again and again and again. Now, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that I hardly ever have to use. It's not because they're not true. They just don't deal with the sin that so easily besets me. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You'll be happy to know your pastor doesn't have to pull that one out every day to fight the temptation to be a drunkard. Thou shalt not kill. Now I am raising four children, but all jokes about parenting aside, I don't have to use that one on a daily basis. Man shall not lie with a man as he lies with a woman, for it is an abomination to God. I I don't have to use that verse, but Ephesians 4.32 is a verse I find myself using, or at least needing to use, on a daily basis. And to be honest, the days I don't use it are probably the days that I violate it and should have used it. This is one you're going to need regularly. And be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, you're going to need that verse because there are always going to be people getting on your last nerve, angering you, infuriating you, abusing you, maligning you, slandering you, mistreating you, doing you wrong, hey, doing you ugly. And I'm just talking about the family reunion. There are always going to be people who will disappoint you. Two-faced, double-tongued, lying hypocrites. And you will find those people to mistreat you. Yes, in the home. You'll find them at school. You'll find them at the ball field. You'll find them at work. You'll even find them at church. How are we to treat one another. Paul tells us how, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, from these few words in this one verse, I want to show you three principles of how to treat one another. Notice with me, first of all, the setting of this message. Our text begins with the word and, and I would encourage you in your memorization of this verse Don't forget the word and, because that's a connecting word, and it reminds us that this verse is not in isolation. It is set in a biblical context. We have the verses before it and immediately after it. We have the context of chapter 4 moving into chapter 5. We have the overall theme of the book of Ephesians, and then this verse is set like a diamond on a gold band. This verse is set... In the, count, in the context of the whole counsel of the Word of God. Now, there's a lot we could say about the setting of this message, but I just want to mention two things, two sort of concentric circles of biblical context. First of all, notice that this verse is in a letter about saving grace. The, the book of Ephesians is a soteriological Letter. It has a lot of doctrinal truth about the doctrine of salvation. Now, the book of Ephesians, like most of Paul's writings, could be rather evenly divided 
into a doctrinal section and a practical section. Bible editors have divided the book of Ephesians into six chapters. And you can almost draw a line right down the middle of it. Chapters 1 through 3 are primarily doctrinal. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are primarily practical. Now, that doesn't mean there's not practical information in the first three chapters, and it doesn't mean there's not doctrinal information in the last three chapters, but chapters 1, 2, and 3 primarily tell you what to believe about salvation. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 tell you primarily how to behave in light of salvation. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 deal with our position. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 deal with our practice. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 deal with the mind. You need right information about the saving grace of God. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 deal not so much with the mind, but with the heart and the hand and the feet and the mouth. This verse is in a letter about saving grace. Now, I have taught you this on a number of occasions, but the book of Ephesians reminds us that you were not saved just by getting cleaned up a little bit. Now, there are verses and analogies, illustrations in the Bible that compare sin to being dirty in need of a cleansing. Isaiah 118, for example, says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as wool. The Bible speaks about the cleansing that we have, the forgiveness of sin. But the The Apostle Paul wants us to know that salvation is most accurately and fundamentally compared not to a dirty person getting clean or a sick person getting healed or a crippled person receiving strength, but he says we're like a dead person being resurrected unto life everlasting. In the opening verses of this letter to the Ephesians, Paul said you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, predestined to adoption as sons, according to the kind intention of His will. And chapter 1 even says that we were chosen according to the plan and purpose of His will. That God in saving grace did something in us and for us that we could have never done for ourselves because we were dead in our trespasses and sins before God. Now, the church at Ephesus, much like the modern American church, took the grace of God to two different extremes, two flawed and erroneous extremes. One extreme said that you earn the grace of God by being good, by keeping the commandments and living a righteous life. The other extreme said because you have experienced and received the grace of God, You can now live any way that you want to. One extreme we would call legalism. The idea that you earn the favor of God. The other extreme we would call licentiousness. That grace gives you a license to sin. To the first group, the one that said you earn the grace of God, the favor of God. Paul said in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a what? A gift of God. Not of what? Not of, not of works because you'd brag about it if it was by work. Not of works lest any man should boast. That's how Paul addressed the, the error of legalism. To the other crowd that wanted to amen the part about grace, He says, I'm not done yet, because in Ephesians 2, now verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. And there's always a balance in sound doctrine. We are not saved by work, but the grace that saved us apart from work now empowers us to do the good work that grace has called us to do. It is in that context Paul writes this letter about saving grace. And he would say to them and to us that if you don't understand how you got saved to start with, then you'll not understand how salvation is to work itself out manifestly and practically in your life. If you understand how you got saved then you know you can't live the same way you used to live before you got saved. 
Because you were dead and grace made you alive. You walked in the darkness, but grace has implanted you into the kingdom of light. You were an enemy of God, says the book of Ephesians. You were a stranger and an alien from the promises and covenants of grace. But now God, through saving grace, has made you a friend of God. You are a slave to sin, but now you are a slave to God. And in light of that, the Bible says you ought to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This message is set in a letter about saving grace. But secondly, it's in a list about sanctifying grace. After three chapters of soul-stirring, mind-transforming doctrine, Paul began the fourth chapter making a transition, moving from our position in Christ to our practice because of Christ. In the first three chapters dealing with our position, you find phrases like, in Him, we're chosen in Him. We are in God. We are in Christ. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with our position. Watch this now. In God, in Him, in Christ. I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul uses one of those positional phrases and drops it right into this practical verse and says we're to treat one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Here we find the intersection and application of right behavior onto right belief. And I want to show you that as we examine the context of this verse. Look back up the page or across the page to chapter 4 and verse 1. Look down in your Bible or your Bible app, chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, in light of all the doctrine, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling, in this context, calling speaks of salvation. Walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which you were called. You could say walk in a way that's consistent with the salvation by which you've been saved. Drop down to verse 17, chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and I testify in the Lord. In other words, I'm not making this up. God told me to tell you this. That you should no longer walk. That speaks of conduct and practice. Don't walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Look down in verse 22. And that you put off. Church, would you say those words, put off? And that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on. Would you say put on? Put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25 begins, therefore. Now throughout chapter 4 and into chapter 5, Paul continually uses the language of putting some things off and putting some things on. He describes and contrasts the new man versus the old man. And he even uses language that describes things that fit and things that ought not fit. Someone making a claim to godliness. He uses, quite frankly, wardrobe language. And he says, there are some things in your life that used to fit the old man, but they don't fit the new man. They they fit you like a hand in a glove when you were lost. But those behaviors don't fit anymore now that you're saved. So you know what you ought to do with those clothes that don't fit anymore? Put them off. And put on the clothes that now fit. Now most of us are old enough. We know what it's like to have had a favorite pair of pants. Maybe a favorite shirt. Ladies, a favorite blouse or skirt or dress. And uh, especially the week after Thanksgiving, you go to put it on and um, (gasps) the dry cleaner shrunk it. (laughs) It just doesn't fit anymore. And all jokes aside, you know it's because you've put on some weight. 
Maybe you heard about the man. He was putting on some weight. Somebody asked him, what size pants do you wear? He said, I wear 36s, but 38s feel so good. I've been buying 40. (laughs) We've all had an occasion where we go to put something on, and it just doesn't fit anymore. Now, when it first begins to not fit, I mean, the first time you try to put it on again, you probably can get in it. You may have to suck in a little bit. You may have to shift it down a little bit, but you can get in it. But it doesn't take very long before you realize it's not comfortable. You can put it on. You can walk around in it a while, but it doesn't feel right. Doesn't fit anymore. In the same way, Paul uses this language contextually And says, when we as the people of God are not kind, when we're not tenderhearted, when we're not forgiving, we we can still act in an ungodly way. But something about that ought not feel right. Something about that ought not fit right. That that when we're unkind to someone, it ought to feel like like a jacket that's one size too small. But then when you put kindness on, something in you ought to say, now that, yeah. That feels better. When you're hard-hearted towards someone, it ought to feel like a pair of shoes that you've outgrown. And you slip those things off and you get yourself into something that fits now. And even your big toe says, that's better. Paul says, there's some behavior that fit the old man. But now that you've been made a new creation in Jesus Christ, that behavior doesn't fit anymore. This analogy is used in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. One of the great passages of the Bible that says, If any man is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Paul says that sound doctrine about salvation should lead to right practice for those who are saved. And right in the middle of that teaching He begins making a list of some of the evidences of sanctifying grace. Look back in your Bible at chapter 4 and verse 25. In this list about sanctifying grace, he says, Therefore, verse 25, put away lying. Verse 26, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27, don't give place to the devil. Verse 28 says, stop stealing. Give to people who have a need. Verse 29, Watch your mouth. You ought to say godly things now that you have experienced grace. Verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Put it away from you. Put it in the yard sale and get rid of it. And put all that malice away. And then he says, and be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. He has just made a list of all the stuff we ought to put off because it doesn't fit us anymore. But he doesn't want you to go around spiritually unclothed. So he says, after you put all that stuff off, there's some things you need to put on. And be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the setting of this message. Watch it again. It's the intersection of right belief about Jesus and right behavior because of Jesus. The setting of this message. Notice with me, secondly, the substance of this matter. Now, there are a lot of verses that I look at in the Bible that I don't immediately understand. In fact, our Sunday morning study of the book of Hebrews, many times I've encountered passages or verses that I don't understand. And I I empty my bookshelf of every commentator from the book of Hebrews. I try to listen to great preachers of yesteryear on that text in Hebrews. I'll call pastors that I know understand the Word of God. Because I don't understand right off the bat what that one verse is saying. But listen, friend, Ephesians 4.32 is not one of those verses. You don't have to have a Ph.D. in New Testament theology to understand what's being said here. It's really not complicated. But how many of you know that doesn't mean it's not hard to do? Imagine if I handed you a shovel 
And I said, I want you to dig a ditch that's three feet wide, three feet deep, and a hundred feet long. That's not hard to know what to do, but it's going to be hard to do. Or this time of year, somebody brings by seven five-gallon buckets full of butter beans, (laughs) unshelled. (laughs) It's not rocket science to know what has to be done, but it's going to take a lot of work to do it. And at the end of a day or two, your thumbs are going to be worse for the wear. In the same way, Ephesians 4.32, is, it's not hard to know what to do. But it's really hard to do. In fact, apart from the work of grace and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's not just hard to do, it's impossible to do. I mean, listen to this list. And be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Now the substance of this matter could really revolve around three little words all right here in the text. And the first one, you ought to write this down, is kindness. And be kind to one another. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit recorded in the New Testament. And this word for kind or kindness is translated elsewhere as good, gracious, and pleasant. Strong's Concordance says that it means to be manageable and easy. The Lord Jesus used this word describing himself in Matthew eleven thirty 30 and said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word Jesus used as easy is this word kind. Again, it means easy, good, gracious, pleasant, manageable. And in this context, it means somebody that's pleasant to be around. Now, do you have anybody in your life that's not pleasant to be around? They're a grouch. They're a grump. They brighten the room every time they walk out. This is the opposite of that. When we demonstrate biblical spiritual kindness, I'm not talking about being fake and phony and a veneer of a smile and a plastered on grin, but genuine kindness, we are easy, pleasant, or manageable to be around. There's some people in my life, and you've got them in your life, they're not easy to be around. And most of the time, if, unless you are forced by family or work relationships to, to be with that person, if you see them coming, they won't see you coming. I mean, if you see them before they see you at Walmart, you're going to do a Walmart duck on aisle seven and go the other way. That is not describing a kind person. The Bible says we're to be easy, good, gracious, pleasant, and manageable to one another. Luke 5, 39 takes this same word and actually translates it as the word better. We're to be better to one another. As I tried to figure out what it means that kindness is better, I got a good example of this when I had to go to Walmart just a few days ago. And I don't, I don't like to go to Walmart. One reason I don't like to go to Walmart anymore is they don't, well, they never had many cashiers in there to start with, 32 registers and three people working. And, and, and now they tend to not even have anybody working the register. They've got somebody floating around and rotating with all the self-checkout registers. And with apologies to those of you that work at Walmart, I just just don't like going in there anymore. And I was in there the other day, and somebody that was in front of me, y'all know what I mean by showing themselves, I'm I'm trying to say it in a nice way, that they they were being a jerk to the employee that was in there. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God said to me, you you can do better than that. You can talk to that lady at the dry cleaners better than the way you did. Students, you can talk to your parents better than the way you did. Sir, you can treat your wife, ma'am, you can can treat your husband better than the way you've been doing. You don't have to act the fool with that person that's driving 20 miles an hour in the left lane on Highway 84 in the morning going to work. You can act better than that now. And be better to one another. 
be manageable to one another, be easy on one another, and be kind to one another. Kindness. I told you, not hard to know what it means, but hard to do. Kindness. There's a second substance of this matter. It's the word tenderness. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Now, I want to be very gracious in the analogy that I'm about to use. And one way I'll do that is by pointing out it's not my analogy. It's the Apostle Paul's analogy. But the word tender-hearted here literally means to be moved in the bowels. Now, in our vernacular, when we use that phrase, we're usually talking about needing to go to the restroom. But in the ancient world, they viewed that emotions were seated in the intestinal region. They thought that what they called the bowels, generally speaking of the overall intestinal area, the bowels were the seat or source of emotion. And that's understandable. Even today, we we describe our emotions and connect it to the stomach. If you're nervous, you say, I've got butterflies in my stomach. If, 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 If the news is really bad, you say, it made me sick to my stomach. If you're worried about something, you say, I've got knots in the pit of my stomach. And this word here, Simon Peter translates it and uses it And it's translated in 1 Peter 3, 8 as the word pitiful. Literally to be pity full or full of pity. That there's something going on down on the inside of us. That quite frankly, and 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 again I'm trying to be gracious, that we would compare in some way or another to that sense in our gut that we need to go to the restroom. And and I think the analogy is this. Something is going on down on the inside of us that we know we've got to do something about. There's a sense internally that, that we've got to act upon externally. This same word is used of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 9, verse 36, one of the several times that Jesus saw a crowd. And the Bible says that Jesus saw the multitude and was moved with compassion. Something was moving and stirring down on the inside of him. He saw them as as faint and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So Paul baptizes this same word and uses it in Ephesians 4.32 and says we are to be moved in our bowels toward one another. Something ought to stir in our hearts. Because of the condition of others. That that I can't see you in need and just walk away unmoved. I can't know about a hurt in your life and turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to it. In fact, when we are raising our children as preschoolers and toddlers, when we're potty training them, one of the things we do, we try to get them to understand that when, when you have that feeling in your tummy, you need to get up and go do something about it. Don't just sit there watching Dora and Diego and, and, and your favorite cartoon. Get, don't just sit there, get up and do something. Are you following the, the illustration? Again, this is just the word the Bible uses and says if you and I are going to live out the life of grace... When we see a need or a hurt in someone else's life, it should stir us on the inside to the point that as mature believers in Christ, we realize I can't just sit here and do nothing. I've got to get up and go act on this emotion. And by the way, the connection of behavior and emotion, this is just one other place in the Bible where the Scripture tells us that we can and we must command our emotions. You say, well, preacher, I just can't help how I feel. The Bible says you can. I can't help the way that I feel. The Bible says you can. In fact, Paul told the Corinthians that we are to take captive every thought and bring it into obedience to Christ. So when I don't want to be kind, when I don't want to be tender, when I don't want to be forgiving... The new man says to the old man, old man, you the old man, and we're going to behave on the basis of the new man we've been made in Christ. 
that desire to be unkind, hard-hearted, and bitter and unforgiving, that may be who I was, but it's not who I am. It may be some vestige or some, some leftover residue from the old man, but I'm not acting on that. I'm getting my emotions and I'm getting my behavior in alignment to the Word of God. That's what it means to take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. And I've taught you on many occasions, it bears repeating. You will behave your way into feeling right long before you'll ever feel your way into behaving right. You'll behave your way into feeling right long before you'll ever feel your way into behaving right. If you wait until you feel like being kind and feel like being tenderhearted and feel like forgiving them, it will probably never happen. But if you'll be kind when you don't feel like being kind, tenderhearted when you don't feel like being tenderhearted, when you'll forgive when you don't feel like forgiving, in God's gracious economy, your emotions will get into alignment with the choice you've made of your redeemed will to just simply do what God said to do. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. There's kindness, there's tenderness, and then, obviously, there's forgiveness. Now, I'm going to say more about forgiveness in the third point of this message, but I just want to point out here that forgiveness is one of those difficult concepts I ever address. And the, the tense or the sense of the word appears twice here. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This is not the typical word for forgiveness. Only Luke and Paul use this word. Luke uses it in chapter 7 to describe the giving of a gift. When Jesus gave the gift of sight to a blind man, it's this word forgiveness. It speaks of giving a gift. Luke 7 also uses it to describe the forgiveness of sin. You remember the woman that came in and and, and knelt at the feet of Jesus? And Jesus said, this woman whose sins were many, she's been forgiven much. This unique word for forgiveness speaks of giving a gift of showing grace. And Luke also uses it in Acts chapter 3. Recording one of the sermons of the apostles says that Jesus was handed over for crucifixion. In the same way that the authorities handed Jesus over to the centurion. They literally passed him off to be nailed to a Roman cross. That's the word for forgiveness. It speaks of giving a gift. It speaks of showing grace. And it speaks of handing something or someone over to another person. And the Bible says that's how you and I are to treat one another. Kindness, tenderness, forgiveness. There's a third thing I want you to notice. And that is the standard of this mandate. What yardstick are we supposed to use to determine if we've been properly kind, tender, or forgiving? Well, there are 17 words in the New King James translation of this verse... Each and every one of them is power-packed and weighty, but I don't think that any of them are more, any more compelling than the next two words. Listen to it and don't, don't, don't rush by these words. Even as. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as. Those two words put together mean do it, do it like this. Here's your example, here's your pattern, here's your role model. Here's the measuring stick. Here's the measuring rod. Do it like this. Like what, Paul? Even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, as we look at the standard of this mandate, I just want us to, I just want us to gaze upon three different things as we close. Number one, this text would invite us, look at your Savior. Don't phone a friend. Don't look at the culture. Don't ask your best buddy or your best girlfriend what they think you ought to do. Because quite frankly, many times they will say, I, I, I wouldn't put up with that if I were you. I wouldn't forgive them if I were you. Don't look to your Sunday school teacher, church leader. Don't even look to the pastor. I want to be honest enough to tell you that if you follow me, 
I, I do hope that I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. But if you make me your ultimate standard, I'm going to lead us both in a ditch sooner or later. Because I've got feet of clay. So here the standard is much higher than any other fellow believer. We are to treat one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Now our Sunday morning study of Hebrews will soon get us to chapter 12 where the writer will tell us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But we don't have to wait on Hebrews 12 to have somebody tell us we need to look to Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God. And if there was ever anybody who was treated wrong but always responded rightly, it was the living Lord Jesus Christ. Someone has said it's a whole lot easier to act like a Christian than to react like a Christian. And Jesus always acted and reacted rightly. How convicting to study his life and to seek to walk in his steps. One who never hit back. Though they hurled insults at him and spat upon him and flogged him with a cat of nine tails and beat him beyond recognition, nailed him to a cruel Roman cross. And the Bible says we are to treat one another even as God in Christ has treated us. And by the power of the Spirit, I beckon you to join me on a trip this morning to a skull-shaped mountain called Calvary and see our lovely Lord Jesus Christ hanging there. His flesh is hanging like ribbons of meat. His life's blood is dripping out of His body and pooling at the foot of the cross. He's choking on his own blood. Watch him and listen as he spits out enough blood to clear his mouth and clear his throat. He's about to say something. And what does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Look at your Savior. Use his life of kindness and tenderness and forgiveness as the standard by which we would evaluate our own treatment of others. Look at your Savior. Secondly, look at your sin. Even as God in Christ forgave. Now this is one of several reminders in the Scripture that forgiveness is not based on the merit of the person being forgiven. I'm going to say that again. Forgiveness is not based on the merit of the person receiving the forgiveness. You say they don't deserve to be forgiven. That's right. And neither did you. And neither did I. So when the Bible says that God in Christ forgave us, what exactly does that word mean? What happened to our sin when God in Christ forgave us? Well, Isaiah 38, 17 says that God put our sin behind His back. That's just an analogy, just kind of a word picture. That when we came to God through Christ, God took our sin and put it behind His back. It's a picture that God is no longer looking at our sin. That He no longer sees our sin. He sees the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 103 verse 12 is one of my favorite pictures there. King David said that God has taken our sin and removed it from us as far as the east is from the west. The book of Hebrews as well as Isaiah 43 tells God promises that he will not remember our sin anymore. And as I've taught you previously, that doesn't mean that God has amnesia and that he has forgotten it. The word remember there means he's not going to bring it up. For the purpose of determining how he's going to deal with us. This means when I am genuinely kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, I can remember intellectually something that someone has done. But when it comes to my mind, it doesn't fill my heart with anger and unforgiveness. And if that person comes to me and says, do you remember that incident in the past? You may, you may honestly say, yeah. What about it? Why are you bringing that up again? 
I have forgiven you. I'm not bringing that up. I have done with your sin what Jesus did with mine. I have taken your sin and I have put it behind my back. I have taken your sin and I have separated it from our relationship as far as the east is from the west. And by the good grace of God he has poured out into my life, I promise by his power I will never bring it up again to determine how I'm going to deal with you. Now to be very clear, this does not negate consequences. Not even in the economy of God does forgiveness negate consequences. But as we are to consider how we treat one another, we need to look at our Savior. I encourage you to look at your sin. And finally, look at yourself. We believe that every word of God is inspired. Amen, church? Don't, don't rush past the last word in the text. What is it, church? Even as God in Christ forgave you. <laughs> you ought to read that and say, even as God in Christ forgave me. Now, it would be a great role model if Paul had written, even as God in Christ forgave the sins of the world. Well, amen. Amen. <laughs> Or if he had said, even as God in Christ forgives all who come to him by faith. That, that'd be sufficient. But I believe the Holy Spirit, through Paul's hand, makes this commandment much more personal and practical. And says, you ought to treat other people the way that God in Christ, not as just treated everybody, but the way that he has treated and forgiven you. In this sense, I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to take just a brief trip down memory lane to the dark, nasty alley of our past to look at our own sins, the ways we have sinned and fallen short of His glory. And if we're honest, the list is far too long for us to ever recite all of the ways that we have sinned against God. Now, while you take this ugly trip into your nasty, previously unconverted past, you don't have to have any guilt. If you're saved, you don't have to have any condemnation. But we ought to have some consideration. I mean, just think about it. If God is commanding us, forgive other people the same way Christ has forgiven you, the only way you can do that is to think back, how forgiven have I been? And when we go back and we look at the things that God has forgiven us of, and by the way, nobody knows all that list but you. We're to then use that as the way that we pour out the grace of God on the lives of others. And I can speak for myself. I believe I can speak for you too. When when I stop and realize all of which I have been forgiven, I am in no position whatsoever to withhold kindness, tenderness, or forgiveness from anyone else. And by the way, did you know according to the Lord Jesus, the way you forgive other people and the way that God will forgive you will eventually match? After giving us what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, it's a model prayer, Jesus continues in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their sins against you, your heavenly Father will forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive men their sins against you, neither will your Father forgive your sins. Wow. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Not long ago I was watching the Outdoor Channel and I came across an episode where they were hunting this rare mountain goat. In fact, for you hunters, it was really probably more of a, of a ram type of animal, but they called it a mountain goat. And because of where it lived in these precipitous mountains, hard to get there and hard to retrieve it, it it's a trophy animal. A- and God has placed these mountain goats in an area where they're just these really steep, rocky mountains. And he has placed within them instinctively the ability to to navigate up and down these rocky 
uh, crevices would just sometimes just be able to have one claw, one foot in a safe place. And sometimes those mountain goats, one of them will be going up the mountain on this tiny, tiny little path. And another mountain goat will be coming down that mountain on that same path. There's no way for them to go around one another. It's kind of like what you used to have if you met, if you met vehicle traffic on an old you know, two-lane two path. Somebody's got to back up or pull over. Well, God has instilled within the instinct of this breed of mountain goat that when one is going up the mountain and the other one is coming down this narrow mountain path, the one that is coming down will kneel down as close to the ground as it can get and let the other one climb up over the top of them. I thought about that when I read this verse. I don't think Ephesians 4.32 means that you and I go through life as a doormat. But I do think it commands us to go through life as a servant. Living like one who laid down his life for our salvation. What I really think it means is, and be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 